Okay, we're going to get started, and I had a very bright slide in the background that was very bright <laughs> for everyone, so I'll put it up at the very end, but we do have a couple of slides that just show the list of ongoing studies that we have at CART, and also some information about our clinical services with phone numbers that you can call for appointments or referrals and those sorts of things, because uh, I got asked a lot of those questions during the breaks, uh, but we'll provide that for you at the end, and also Monica is going to... Um, have updated slides available so she can also add those in. Uh, so I have a very large assortment of questions organized in some ways by theme. Um, and I'm going to go through and actually choose them and, add, and, and I'll put it out to the group but I'll kind of pinpoint individual people to answer and then we can make it a discussion. But first, I thought everyone could quickly go down the row again and just state who you are and what your claimed area of expertise is. <laughs> <laughs> This work. Okay, I'm Susan Buchheimer, I'm a neuroimaging expert, uh, and I'm a professor here in the um, uh, Center for Autism Research and Treatment and in the Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Research Center and the Center for Cognitive Neurosciences. Mm -hmm. I have to follow that. Um, I'm Amanda Goldsrud. Um, I'm the clinical director of the Child and Adult Neurodevelopmental Clinic here, as well as an assistant professor in psychiatry. My area of interest uh, in research is in early identification and intervention, as well as the community partner work and working in low resource communities. Hi, I'm Sunil Mehta. I'm a child psychiatrist in the Child and, Develop and Adult Neurodevelopmental Clinic, as well as the developmental Neurogenesis Clinic. Um, so clinically, I treat a lot of kids with autism, and then research-wise, I'm interested in using animal models to model um, findings in autism genetics. Dan Geschwind. I'm the director of CART. I'm a neurologist and a, uh, a geneticist, so we try to connect uh, genes to brain. <laughs> I'm Odin von Ernstein. I'm an environmental epidemiologist and faculty in community health sciences at the School of Public Health. I'm Ted Hutman. I'm a clinical and developmental psychologist. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry. I'm a co investigator on the um, infant sibling research project, interested in early detection. And um, clinically, I'm interested in the parents' experience. That segues perfectly into sure. question number one, sure. well, which is for Dr. Hotman, possibly Dr. Gelstrud. Um, and sorry, you all know me, I'm Dr. Jessica I'm a child neurologist, and I also direct the neurophysiology lab at CART. So we integrate EEG biomarkers with several studies that focus on early predictors as well as clinical stratification prior to treatment. Uh, so um, the question is for Ted and Amanda, and that is uh, about mom child interaction in early development and how that might impact the development of autism. So specifically one of the questions was, um, has anyone actually studied mom-child interaction and could it be a factor in the development of autism? Go for it. I'll follow okay. up. All right. Um, the, the short answer is it has been studied. We have studied it. We're studying it currently. Uh, Mother-child interaction is incredibly important. Moms should play with their babies and have a good time. Um, could it be a factor in the development of autism? That, that part I don't completely agree. You can't cause it. I can tell you that. Um, mothers don't cause autism. And I don't think that you can even prevent it. Um, but I think that you can boost the your child's outcome by playing in an undemanding way and, and making play fun because that will make social interaction rewarding and, and that would be my goal clinically is that, um, to boost the, the child's enjoyment of looking at her face. I talked before about um, gaining skills secondary to paying attention to faces. So um, social interaction should be fun and should be working. And just to follow up, um, we do a lot of parent-child um, interventions, and I think this kind of addresses the question is, what we're finding is that a, a parent of a child with autism almost has to be a super parent. So some of the normal strategies and, and interaction styles don't often or, or don't always work with our kids with, with autism, and so there is a transactional kind of 
thing going on when, you know, a child isn't responding to you. Um, and it makes it difficult for the parent. And so that's why we think that these more specific trainings can be very helpful because they, you really do have to sometimes learn new skills in order to support your child in learning some of these very early and core areas. Great. Okay, I love this next question that uh, is actually relevant to both Dr. Bonnanstein and Dr. Gashman. And that is regarding environmental factors that might influence the development of autism. The question is basically about gene environment interactions and whether we can tease those things apart with mouse models. This so is specifically what the question was can mouse models be used to create environmental exposures that could then help tease apart? Uh, which factors actually contribute to the development of autism. Do you want to start? Um, I could try first. So that kind of research has been done. I mean, that's going on. So I didn't go into the animal studies at all. So I focused on population-based research, basically. So, and there are, I mean, but the most models, I'm not the most competent. I know the research about it. So. Um, People do that, you, I mean, administer different pesticides, for example, to mice, and measure outcomes that have been associated or linked, find parallels with autistic behaviors, maybe. And about the mice, you probably know about, about more of that. I'd say the critical issue for any animal model is, well, let's back up. Maybe, maybe we can break it down into three issues. One is what we call construct validity. That means, does the thing that causes, are you modeling something that actually causes autism in mice? I'll give you an example of a mouse that doesn't have construct validity. So there's one that's used called the BTBR mouse, in which just studying the mouse, they found that it looks, it doesn't interact normally socially. Well, if I found an ant that didn't interact socially with its group or any species, that's social dysfunction, but we don't know how that relates to autism at all in humans, or human social behavior. So the first thing is this construct validity. Does the thing that we're using to model, is there evidence that it has a causal role in autism? So all of a sudden, we're in a really difficult area because a lot of epidemiology is correlational, and it you can infer cause from that and you might want to test cause experimentally. So what you would be doing is saying, well, I have an environmental exposure in humans that's that seems to be correlated with an increased risk for autism. Now I want to give it to a mouse to see if it causes autism in the mouse. Well, the problem is mice don't get autism. And so you could ask then, does it cause social dysfunction in the mouse, and what's that? But the connection there is not as strong as you'd like it as if you were starting with a genetic model. So it really, it, it creates a conundrum, like we're in a circle in the field. We're looking at that stuff. I don't have a great answer to it. It's a fantastic question. Um, the way I look at it as a geneticist and not as an epidemiologist is when there's an epidemiologic finding of some exposure, I always like to see, just like in genetics, same thing, I like to see it independently replicated, perhaps even using a different study design, so that the same potential confounders aren't, aren't there. And once you see something replicated a couple times, then it starts to get pretty interesting. Then you have to ask, okay, this, this, this looks like a pretty strong factor, genetic or environmental, doesn't matter. I think we have a real difficulty in, you know, in studying those in, you know, in mice. Um, there are a lot of issues. I mean, um, so we know that how we respond to an environment is also genetic, right? There are people who smoke like a chimney, they don't get lung cancer, people who don't need to do, I mean, there are all kinds of exposure things like that. Cholesterol, heart disease, you know, all these things, right? We all know these. There are people who are morbidly obese for their whole life and live to 90, and there are people who are in shape and skinny who die at age 55. And so, you know, how do we, you know, a lot of that probably has to do with genetic background. And so how an environmental factor is going to act on a mouse that has an entirely, it's not a small human, is another really important issue. 
So I actually would like to see some of these studies being done in humans where you actually have the genetic background and can understand how the, and my first step would be to think about how the genetic background might influence the environmental exposure. Once you find something like that in a large enough population, then maybe you could model that in a mouse by genetically engineering the mouse and then giving the environmental exposure. So I'm really interested in these gene environment interactions. There's all this literature now on maternal immune exposure and developmental disorders. You may have heard of this. Who's, have you guys heard of this? I'm sorry, I'm going on and on. I'm like giving another talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, <laughs> so just shut me up, Shafali, if you have to. No, it's great. Uh, um, I, I so, call it like seven questions okay. on purpose. So. Okay, so um, the, uh, where were we? Oh yeah. Um, um, so yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, the issue is is uh, so so. If we get to this issue of studying in humans, you could imagine that we could understand in humans how ge our genetic background affects, let's say, maternal exposure or something. So we know that. I'm going to give you an example on schizophrenia. So in schizophrenia, you can look at the ratio of sharing of schizophrenia between identical twins and fraternal twins. Identical twins share the uterus, plus they share all their genes. Fraternal twins are like siblings, genetically. They could be, but the difference is they've shared, as my brothers who are fraternal twins say, they're womb mates. <laughs> <laughs> So they share this maternal environment. And so if there's a maternal environmental effect, often the sharing, the concordance, the identity between dizygotic twins is greater than that of siblings because they've shared the womb. And so in schizophrenia, it's like a two to one ratio. So it tells us clear, and there's tons of epi evidence as well from epi exposure data, from, you know, um, influenzas and other stuff that, that there's a maternal that there are maternal factors in schizophrenia which is another neurodevelopmental disorder and um, in autism the jury's still out there um, the, the dizygotic the fraternal twin sharing versus siblings is not massively elevated if it is elevated and it might be it's a little bit maybe 20% elevated so that's a critical piece of data but there is other epi data that's kind of interesting around the edges there about maternal exposure. And so people have started to make mouse, the reason I'm going into maternal exposure is because this is the best mouse model there is out there. So people have given maternal exposure of viruses or virus, various immune challenges, many different ones in different laboratories. And the mice that are born after that, the offspring after the mother was had this inflammatory experience, have mouse, they don't have autism, they have mouse social deficits, they have mouse repetitive behavior, they sometimes have learning difficulties. So clearly maternal exposures, we, you know, we've known that for a while, but even maternal infection or inflammation in a mouse can cause significant later behavioral changes. So I think it's something we have to be aware of, and that's a good model because, you know, the human stuff is very strong. We can make that in the mouse and stuff. So um, that's a place where, where there is a, a nice kind of correspondence between the epidemiology, the genetic epidemiology, and the mouse modeling. I think some of the other areas, it's going to be more challenging, but one could imagine doing the same kind of work. The difficulty, can I leave one last thing, then I'll shut up. You can go is Second. what <laughs> unlikely yeah um, I'm not promising as you can see um, the uh, is that when we are doing a psychiatric diagnosis or a neurobehavioral diagnosis of a child or an adult we're at we're we're watching them and we're often talking or interacting with them we're getting feedback one way or another and from that we're inferring certain aspects of cognition and certainly to make the diagnosis, schizophrenics have very abnormal social behavior. And in fact, many adults with autism are misdiagnosed as schizophrenic because they might be walking around behaving oddly. 
Well, behaving oddly, we all do from time to time. And the point is that if, you're, if it's because you're having, getting messages in your teeth that are directing you to do certain things, that's one stuff. The other thing can be just that you're, you know, talking to yourself. Um, you know, uh, you, know you, you don't have delusions or hallucinations or any of the things, you know, the, the thought disorder that is part of schizophrenia. How do you do that in a mouse? So the mice aren't interacting with each other much, like I showed you with the, you know, the oxytocin mouse. You could see they were just sitting there, but the ones that are oxytocin were interacting. We are inferring their social ability by their interaction. We're not asking them, are you hallucinating? Why you know, are you not interacting? And so we have a difficulty there in that we're never gonna be able to do that in the mouse until maybe we'll have functional imaging where we can find the circuits that are abnormal in humans and mice that are having hallucinations and you know and and actually have another biomarker but right now the behavior is stuck so anyway can I add one word? Sure, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Of course. Um, just one point in addition, which is in specific to the environmental exposures in this, in this connection. Toxicity is, can be very different interspecies. So it's not the ideal approach to look into animal studies, on the contrary. For example, arsenic is one example. The toxicity is a, a thousandfold around higher in humans than in rats. So, and the, for example, classifying arsenic as a carcinogen is entirely based on human population studies and not any, any animal data, because it just doesn't support it. Yeah. Super interesting. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, That's, so yeah. we have hundreds of questions and... Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. That was a little no, message. No, yeah, I keep your things to the point and short. I'm yes. Choosing questions that I think <laughs> will allow for a little bit more comprehensive discussion. Uh, what we might try to do, and I'll talk with Monica after the session, is that we'll try to type out some of the questions and maybe do kind of a running ask that source on our website so that we can sort of post some questions and have each of us take turns. Sorry to just volunteer all of us for doing that. <laughs> uh, but that might be way. So there's some really great questions here, and we just don't have time for all of them. And we'll try to go down the road just to hit different themes. So Dr. Metha is sitting in for Dr. McCracken, who may end up joining us toward the end. Uh, he's a psychiatrist and uh, deal, uh, takes care of a lot of children from a psychopharmacological standpoint. And a lot of the questions that were asked were regarding long-term side effects of medications. So many parents have concerns when we start medications, particularly like Abilify or Risperidone, which are approved, and so they're used quite widely, whether there are long-term side effects with these medications. So I wondered how you approach that conversation with families and what we know about the studies in that. So um, it's a great question. Um, the long-term side effects of the medication depend largely on what that medication is. Um, but the most commonly used class of medications in children with autism spectrum disorder are the antipsychotics. Um, and they're a very common long-term side effect are what we call metabolic side effects, where um, taking these medications over a long period of time um, leads to weight gain. It also leads to insulin um, resistance, which can appear to look like diabetes. Um, it can cause increased cholesterol. Um, now, one thing where the research, and so this is well documented in the research. There have been decades long studies looking at this. Um, the one thing uh, that these studies have shown is that these effects are dose dependent and time dependent. Um, what is not clear from the research currently is if your child has been on these medications, how long does it, and you stop taking them, how long does it take before their metabolism normalizes? Um, I can speak sort of from clinical experience that it varies per child, but in most cases, the metabolism tends to normalize, and children who gained a lot of weight on a particular drug can lose that weight again. Um, uh, and so this is a known sort of issue that practitioners and families deal with, or deal with and continue to have to deal with. Um, on the other hand, all, whenever you take any medication, it's kind of a cost-benefit analysis. So the risks associated with the medication are that you, know, you can gain weight, you can have these metabolic side effects, they can cause health problems later in life. Um, 
And so every, for every child, it's sort of a different calculus. Is the benefit worth that? So for some children, um, the difference between taking medication and not taking medication is a huge difference in functionality, whether they're able to go to school, what level they're able to function at in school. Um, and so it's a very difficult decision for families and um, to have to make. Um, and, and for each child, that, that decision is going to be different. Um, the other thing, though, that I, I wanted to point out to people was that even within a class of medications, because your child has particular side effects with one medication, doesn't mean that they will have them with all of the medications in that class. And so this is one of the frustrating things about um, treating kids pharmacologically with kids with autism pharmacologically in that it is still very much a trial and error process in which, um, you know, it's <laughs> treating kids with autism is really building a relationship with the families because you are going to try lots of different things over time before you find um, a particular combination that works for each child. I'll just quickly add and say that because of the fact that these medications have not been FDA approved and studied for decades, we don't have a lot of longitudinal studies that look at long-term outcomes. It's a very good question, and there are several studies around the country that are trying to do that now, you know, by following children out, uh, you know, 5, 10, 20 years. Uh, the goal with these meds, though, is not to treat children forever, right? Treat children into adulthood forever. The idea is to actually, let it, you know, to improve symptoms enough to lay a foundation so that children are more amenable to educational interventions and you know, either one-on-one -on -one or in schools and those sorts of things. So we're really trying to solve a short-term severe problem so that then we can lay a foundation for longer-term um, kind of interventions. So we don't, our goal is not to have individuals on these medications for their life. Yeah, I, I actually did want to clarify the, the data that's out there on these medications long term is actually in adults, mostly with schizophrenia. So um, Shafali is correct in that you know we haven't followed a bunch of five-year-olds for 20 years to see what happens to them. So this is what we're inferring from what happens to adults. Okay, so a question for Dr. Galstrud uh, about the wonderful working community partnership. You mentioned in your talk that the weight list to receive a diagnosis and then, of course, intervention in the community is quite delayed, up to nine months. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what do we do about that? What are the resources available and how might we, um, how might someone in the community access uh, a diagnosis and services more quickly? Um, it's a good question. And it's one that our work groups have been thinking a lot about in community. And um, I think, you know, what we're finding is sometimes it's a problem of just knowing where to go and how to navigate the system and knowing your rights as a family. Um, and so it may start with just increasing awareness and education. Um, that may, may help families get through the door a, a bit. Um, but what we're finding is once they get to the door um, of a potential service provider or um, someone who may give a diagnosis, that they're also told to wait just for the appointment, for the evaluation. And so that can be quite frustrating for families, and some of them actually fall off at that point, and they give up, and, and, they're, and they're not um, persistent in that. And so we're actually in the process right now of developing an intervention where we partner with families at the point of first concern, and we, we um, help navigate them through the system, and we're with them during that wait period, because we think, we think if we can link them into something during that period, these families are more likely to uptake, um, you know, and, and end up accessing long-term interventions um, that are appropriate. And so um, we are, we're developing this intervention and we'll be piloting it actually very soon in community. So um, stay tuned, but it's coming organically from what we're hearing uh, about this problem with access and navigation. Great, so we talked a lot today and various talks about precision medicine which is really the, you know, our goal in neurodevelopmental disorders. And uh, one of the several questions and themes that came up in these, um, in, from the audience, which are great questions, are regarding the role of neuroimaging 
in precision medicine, and specifically, can we, do you think we'll be at a place where we can use imaging to identify subtypes that will help guide treatment? Um, we're certainly not in the place now, and the main reason is, um, well, aside that more research needs to be done, uh, is that it's very expensive. Um, imaging is an extremely expensive technology, especially done in the clinical world and the research world. It's um, much less expensive for us researchers, and of course it's free for any of you who have a child who wants to uh, volunteer. Um, so that is a, um, a serious limitation. Um, so I think that the trajectory is probably going to be something like this, that we'll do imaging studies in conjunction with behavioral studies, genetic studies, EEG studies, and learn how to identify neural subtypes uh, based on those that combination of studies, and then hopefully from that information um, be able to find less um, expensive ways of looking at the same subtypes. Uh, it may be, for example, looking at imaging markers, correlating them with the EEG biomarkers, and EEG is something that's much more easily accessible in the community, and then it could be used as a broader screening tool. Um, of course, there may be a day when MRI is much cheaper. Um, there are some new technologies out on the horizon um, that don't require the magnets to be super cooled, which would make the um, imaging machines so cheap that pretty much every doctor could have one. But that's probably a couple of decades away. But when that does happen, um, then it could very well be used as a um, as a tool to screen to uh, to look at subgroups and then to treat accordingly. But that's not the Great. Yeah, and from the EEG perspective, I would just say that EEG is cheaper, but it's also very noisy. And in the field, and this is actually efforts from around the country, we actually have a consortium now uh, that will knock on wood, hopefully, be funded by NIH very soon to. Think about EEG biomarkers as both tools for clinical stratification and in identifying meaningful subjects for treatment in autism. And one of the biggest challenges is that EEG, while accessible, uh, is associated with lots of environmental noise and also just the fact that because it's so temporally sensitive, meaning it is identifying brain activity in real time, as you can imagine, brain activity changes at a second's pace, right? So what is the true signal of that child that really represents something clinically meaningful versus what is the measure of, are we just measuring the state of the child in that moment, right? So what is the true signal that relates to uh, a feature that's clinically meaningful? And that those are sort of the questions that we are asking in the field. And I would say that I'm very hopeful, and I would say actually I'm quite certain that watching it out in 10 years, I'll be up there hopefully giving better data on this, but I really think in the next five to 10 years, we will be in a place, as we've really gotten to it with genetics, where combining tools like genetics with imaging, we will actually be able to clinically subtype children in a much more mechanism-driven way so that then we can target treatment. So I think we're really approaching that next um, kind of phase of precision medicine. Uh, okay, so we have a lot of questions about genetics. I'm gonna go back over to Dan for a little bit. Um, I thought this was a great, simple question, which is what causes de novo mutations? The it's, simple, maybe. it's not, it's, <laughs> they're actually, there are multiple different kinds of causes and different kinds of mutations. There are recurrent de novo mutations which occur in areas where there are actually copy number repeats in our genome that are flanking each other so when the DNA copies it gets confused sometimes and deletes, there's like a crossing over inappropriately. That's, that's one cause of the things that we see recurrently, like 15Q, 16P, all that whole list of things that I had up on that crazy table. So that's one cause. Um, single base pair mutations are random, and it's, it's, it's unknown, although there are hypotheses, and people are actually studying that right now. Um, but it, it's almost certainly has to do with the DNA repair mechanisms. So, you know, when the DNA has been copied, Mistakes are always made, like any, but there's proofreading things that are going by right behind, and the proofreading sometimes misses, and so it, it's likely something like that, that, you know, in one mechanism. Now, you can create de novo mutations by irradiating, you know, and things like that, so it's, there's no question that um, chemicals and other mutagens cause mutations randomly throughout the genome by breaking the DNA either during replication usually or repair. So um, it's an interesting place for gene-environment interaction. 
and why men's, you know, as, you know, we all know as we get older, right, you injure your, like, I remember when I was seven years old and I would cut my hand, it would heal in like 48 hours, it would be gone. Now, you, you know, now I'm a little older than that, and, um, you know, over the, each decade, the repair is slower. And um, it's, it's probably very, very similar um, in, in the, when sperm is, you know, because a woman's eggs are, are set from birth, they're no, no longer dividing. So while they're sensitive to mutagens, they're not sensitive to the kind of mutagens that act during DNA replication, which is the most sensitive time. But the sperm keeps going on. So therefore, we think as men get older, it's just, you know, just like everything else is falling apart, so is that <laughs> at some level. You know, um, I know that's a little hand wavy, and, and there are specific things that people are now looking at, very specific enzymes and repair processes to see what's affected. One of the problems is that so many things are affected. This is a question for Dr. Hedman Milster. What do you think is the most robust, and this is not, I'm not making this up, I promise it's here. Uh, what do you think is the most robust behavioral predictor of ASD? Ooh. Depends on what age, maybe. You, so prior to that, I, I early, just, early, just prior to that, this is so early. Infancy. Yeah. In infancy. Um, I mean, I think. We talk a lot about social attention, um, and I think that's critical. And I, Dr. Hutman's talk talked a lot about different aspects of what we consider kind of broader context of social attention. Um, but I think you know where children are looking and fixating, and how they're shifting attention in the social world, um, even as in, an infant, um, is very powerful, and I think that that's something that I would look at very, very early on. And um, just a little bit of a shameless plug here, but you know, in our center, you know, the babies that I'm seeing between 12 and, and 21 months of age, you know, I there's a ton of variability in what I'm seeing, but really that core social communication aspect is really what is presenting first um, in these children. Um, the RRB seem to kind of be developing a bit later, the stickiness and the rigidity, I'm really seeing that core social attention stuff emerging. So, <coughs> our data suggests that the, the best predictor I've gotten my hands on so far is actually response to me. Um, that we've, we've identified a lot of different behaviors that were associated with outcome and um, at Dan's suggestion actually we tried to model this, we put a bunch of them in the hopper together to see if they were all getting this, if it was one signal for joint attention, initiating joint attention, chronic joint attention, empathy, um, and the, the strongest predictor was response to name, which is interesting. It's part of the EOS, which is our gold standard diagnostic tool. Um, Oh, when we started this, I really thought in terms of single variables like that, you know, what is, where is the signal? Well, if you look at the diagnostic approach, you need to have, what, like six different symptoms in order, there is no one symptom that gets you a diagnosis, like atypical eye contact. So I'm more of the mind out, I'm interested in modeling um, atypical development, so I, I think that it's it's not the right approach to try it. And you know, it's a great question. I don't mean to um, criticize the question, but I'm just having got this now for like a dozen years and thinking more in terms of multiple multiple predictors being the way to go. Um, and actually, I want to stick to early markers for one more question, uh, which is uh, that several people asked the question about the public health relevance and public health implications of our uh, awareness of early markers uh, and whether you thought that it already had changed in terms of access to services earlier uh, and if not how you think that the early early science research could move um, policy towards getting kids earlier interventions yeah i think public awareness campaigns have definitely been working i mean I'm, 
even five years ago, I mean, thinking about intervening and giving a behavioral intervention to a 12-month-old um, would have been unheard of. So I think something is changing um, for the positive, which is great. Um, I think where I have had growing concern, because I've been in the early intervention world for a long time, is, you know, the, uh, again, the inequity of, of, of access. And so it's happening in um, communities maybe around UCLA. Um, families are coming to me with concern, um, but it's not happening as much in some of my other communities that I work in. And um, so that's, that's concerning. And that's a problem. But I think overall, awareness has increased, and it's definitely led to earlier detection of at-risk children that are now getting interventions, um, which is quite exciting. It's not enough of that work being done, but it is being done. I'd like to make a political statement. <laughs> um, just uh, one of the concerning things about age of diagnosis is that if a child is diagnosed while they're in elementary school, it becomes a school problem. They're diagnosed before it becomes part of the medical system. So there are very large healthcare organizations out there that want to say that um, they've lost this case, but it's an issue, um, that, that want to make the case. And you can't blame them because the incentives are all in the wrong place. We have a healthcare system that's private. We have an educational system that's largely public and fr fragmented. And in other countries that are as civilized as we are, they're all run by the same government. It's all the same people, the same taxpayers. So the incentive is to diagnose as early as possible, treat as early as possible, prevent, you know, change trajectory to prevent, you know, what's going to happen later in a burden on society, the family, and the child. <laughs> Here, there's actually a perverse incentive to not diagnose the child in some, you know, think about it, because then you have to provide them care before they go to school. But if, if it becomes an educational rather than a medical problem. So that's one of the problems with having a lot of different pockets that are paying. Even the most well-meaning pockets are smart to kind of punt it right to the other pocket because everybody's under under resourced. So so it's a real I think we have a serious issue in our country around these issues. And at the beginning of life we have them, at the end of life we have them as well. Right? Yeah, I actually wanted to make a, a statement about that too, um, which is that at, at places like UCLA and at CART, um, very young kids might get diagnosed, but in the vast majority of the country, it's pediatricians who are at the front lines. And I think one of our roles and one of our jobs is to educate and work with the pediatric community in terms of screening. And I think that's actually why that ties into the earlier question of early markers and what's the most predictive um, feature because I think a lot of primary care physicians um, are desperately seeking guidance and help on when is it appropriate to screen and what do I do more importantly once something happens, once a screen is positive. Um, and I think you know, our field in terms of autism research has to do a better job of, of working with primary care physicians. Great. So there were many questions about different environmental exposures and how they might uh, cause or um, be associated with autism. And I'm going to just put them together in a theme, which is technology. So there were questions about cell phones and our access to things like microwaves and um, even screens like computers and smartphones and things like that. So I wondered if, if uh, people are doing research in that area, what your thoughts are on that, given that as the rise, there's been sort of a rise in prevalence of autism, there's also been a great rise in our access to technology. That's a great question. Your question oh, of course, a great question. <laughs> so there are a lot of concerns about these issues, and for, for many years, and I mean in the field of brain tumors, for example, mm -hmm. um, the, one of the problems that we have right now, basically, is everybody's exposed. So there is right. um, really no nowhere to go or to design the study. So what I told you about designing air pollution research is already challenging. It would be a lot more challenging to get valid results uh, looking at these kind of exposures. Um, there is a little bit of research out there, but in, in terms of what's published, so I'm not aware of... Um, some any strong findings in that direction. If there was a, 
a considerable, a considerable association. I mean, I would say we would be facing an epidemic of autism since everybody is using this technology. The rates would be a lot higher, basically, than what we are seeing. Um, yeah, that, I guess, is There's a response. Yes, but not everybody is using it. Everybody is living it in this culture. That's why I think we should try to see what is the rate of autism in third world countries. Where they don't use cell phones. They don't have microwaves. It's a great, yeah. Yeah, and so, yeah, so some of that is going on now, like the, you know, international, global research, and uh, the jury is still out, so there aren't definitive large-scale studies yet, but from what I understand from a lot of these countries, India, Africa, places like that, again, I don't know how many of you have been out into the African bush um, or climbing. I've been climbing in the Atlas Mountains with Berbers. Every single one of them has a cell phone. They use it more than we do. Um, so I think the, 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 the sense that, so, in fact, in those countries, cell phone ubiquity happened faster than here because there aren't landlines. And so... Um, but there, but there are clearly differences in terms of, you know, what people are being exposed to. Um, uh, but it is an interesting issue that sometimes, and, and you'll speak to this better, that even in rural areas, sometimes the exposures uh, are much higher than they actually are in urban areas for certain things. So it's a very tricky issue. But so far, there really is not much evidence for differences in autism prevalence across different. Um, uh, you know, first versus third world. Um, when people have looked at it carefully, gone in and tried to assess it. It hasn't been done in enormous scale, but so far there doesn't look to be. Another point to make is that I think there are two studies that have looked retrospectively to ask, is there an increase in autism? If we take, maybe, um, if you take the current diagnostic criteria and apply them to records that are 30 years old and go through the records in a blinded fashion, you get one in a hundred. So, you know, again, this it gets to this point if, 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 if the, uh, so it used to be one in 2000, but it's because it, it, a lot of that can be attributed to, to diagnostic issues, not to a real increase. Prevalence is now one in a hundred or one in 68. You could <coughs> just call it one in a hundred. You know, there hasn't been a 10 to 100 fold increase in autism. That's pretty clear. It has not occurred. And, 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 and yet there's been a, infinity fold increase in cell phone use in the last 20 years. So, yeah, so I would say, yeah. Um, it doesn't mean there aren't environmental factors, don't, you know, it's just, so far it doesn't look like those things are the driver. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a very important point, and it's a question that, uh, as researchers and as questions, we get asked a lot, which is, why is there so much and it's quite clear that a large proportion of that rise is due to our awareness and diagnostic practices. Kids are getting diagnosed younger, so the average age of diagnosis has gone down. We see less lower severity, children with lower severity being diagnosed more often. Not that autism is less severe now, it's that we're picking up symptoms of ASD in children who 15 years ago might have received a label of ADHD or just a little socially awkward or some language you know, impairment, that sort of thing. And that's been you know, shown through data just on the kind of characteristics of children that we're diagnosing with autism now. Um, maybe just one comment, final comment. I mean, identifying a single environmental factor, I mean, that's not going to happen. So, and, and the research around that is very complex because we do have all these co-exposures and these, we are exposed to mixtures. So that seems more likely that there is something about, yeah, this mixture that we're exposed to than having, oh, it's cell phones. But couldn't um, it be through radiation and then mutation, the avenue? Because you could radiate, I mean, you're saying in terms of this, yeah. So the at least from the from mutation that would the total de novo yeah. parental age signal gives you a risk of three. The risk is a hundred. Mm -hmm. You know the pop. You know the risk. You know one percent versus the person who has it. So it 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 can only explain a very very small percentage. Um, it can explain a little percentage, but it's a very small. And it, it certainly would, in, would, would not account for a rise, a, a huge rise. It would, it would account for a statistically significant rise that you could observe that might be 5 or 10 percent. It wouldn't account for a 10 or 20-fold rise or anything like that. So 
It has a later expression such as brain tumors, etc. Pardon me? It could be a subsequent expression such as in terms of brain tumors. Like somatic and mutations and those kind of things. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. That hasn't been explored much. Yeah, so. Um, okay, so yeah. we have about three minutes left. Um, I do have a couple of more questions that we could pose, but I just wondered, does anyone in the audience have a really burning question that you would love to see someone on this panel answer? You win. Oh, wow. yeah. First hand up. Oh, I would think that with the increased attention uh, to autism spectrum disorder, that children who are just a bit socially awkward, children who are yeah. highly intelligent and perhaps mm -hmm are thinking about things that their peers are, are getting pushed onto the spectrum where it's really not appropriate. They're carrying a label. Mm -hmm. I don't, this is yeah. addressed to any of you. I'd like to have one of the clinicians, but... I'll, I'll speak to you. Yeah. 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 Okay. What I would say is that based on DSM-5 and DSM-4 and DSM-3, you know, all of the diagnoses in that book um, require that there's functional impairment. And I think that's the piece that I really try to emphasize with families, with diagnosticians and other things. We do all these you know, tests like the ADOS and the ADI and all these measures that help us, but in the end of the day, a clinical diagnosis is based on someone having functional impairment. So there's absolutely a range in individuals social abilities, right? Everyone is not going to be prom king or be president, or, you know, president. They're maybe not a great example, but you know, so, uh, everyone's not going to be completely social or even have, you know, um, exquisite language abilities, right? But it's not autism unless the social communication impairment impacts their functioning. If it's in a young child, it's functioning in school and the peers. If it's an adult, it's adaptive skills in terms of getting a job or, or you know, or sustaining a job in the, or being in the work environment, those sorts of things. So, and that's very, that's actually very clearly stated in, in DSM. Um, adaptive skills are a really big part of how we think about severity of symptoms. Uh, so I agree with you that there are often times that diagnoses are made when it seems as though, you know, they may be questionable, but if, you, if, if one sticks very rigorously to the diagnostic criteria, that shouldn't actually be an issue. But there is this category of nerds. <laughs> oh, what? A nerd? Yeah. Well, They're not eligible for service. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But sometimes nerds need social skills groups. And it might help them, actually. Yeah. You know, because they might have IQs of very high IQs and have social skills. They could be challenges, yeah. and those sorts of services might help them, right? So uh, I think that it's a very good point and well taken. Yes. So there's a lot of poetry going on in terms of biomedical intervention for autism, and we all know that you know, people talk about chelation, people talk about all kinds of crazy high doses of supplements, things like that. With more awareness, and we, especially with the genetics advances, is there any initiative out there to, to teach and, and the community and also to perhaps train the so-called uh, protocol specialist, I'm going to name the names, to really step back and not hurt the children. I mean, this is crazy. I mean, for, for those of us who come from clinical research and other backgrounds, it's offensive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's, it's a very odd thing. The sociology and anthropology of this is very interesting because it does not happen in, in any other childhood disorder that I'm aware of to this extent. In cancers, this kind of thing can happen both in adults and in children because if you, it, you know, again, I think it's when you're faced with, with something for which the biomedical community isn't providing answers, you go looking elsewhere. We can't stop the people who are doing crazy stuff that's unethical from doing that. We speak out against it, we do what we can. Um, and what's remarkable is when somebody like Wakefield, right, who was a scientist and, you know, had, had the degrees, published stuff that was clear, you know, that's been clearly fraudulent, where he lost his medical license now, and is now still going around. And um, I don't know exactly what he's doing, I don't follow him, but I hear periodically that this guy, who has been defrocked, totally, you know, discredited, um, formally, over and over again, he hasn't, is, is now still going around and now trying to kind of you know, regain his status and saying that there was a conspiracy out or who knows what. What can you do? 
but it, it is a very, it, it's a very peculiar sociologic and anthropologic kind of issue that, that people who know more about that than me should probably study, and I think people are looking at this. Paul Offit does a very good job of attacking this issue in the vaccine book, Autism's False Prophets, is that what, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, I urge you to read that book. Um, if, if you have it, because it really deals with, with this issue on that specific thing and kind of how people, and it talks about Wakefield and other people like that who are clearly fraudulent and clearly have gain and are getting paid a lot of money, uh, you know, outside and not disclosing it and all those kind of things. Um, I don't know what to say. You know, um, um, the whole field publishes, does what it can, people cheat, people are unethical. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I don't know, I, um, and I don't mean to be defensive about it. I, you know, if you have some ideas, it, it would be great. You know, we should talk about it afterwards. Or, you know, it speaks so much to the power now of the internet because, and I, my stance on this is that I think we do as scientists need to take more responsibility. I think that we, well, a, we don't have enough evidence-based medicine treatments out there, right? So, you know, parents are doing what they should do as parents. They're going on, they're going to Google, and they're looking for treatments. And it's, when you Google autism treatments, the first thing that comes up is not, you know, the randomized controlled trial of Abilify. It is chelation, and it's, you know, it's, you know, hyperbaric oxygen, and it's all these things. And so I think that we need to be better about getting the message out about what is scientifically studied and proven and what is not. And I think that, you know, in the next, again, decade, I think that we are moving towards a place where we will have more treatments available. But it's very challenging as a parent to go on to the internet and try to navigate what has scientific evidence and what doesn't. Because there's lots of these, you know, literally, and there's chelation trials. You can go on, you know, online and find these trials in journals that I don't know if they even exist, but they have their names. And, you know, there are case controlled studies of people who have shown, quote, improvement with things like chelation. So it's hard to, how does a parent know that that's not a valid study, right? And I think that that's where, you know, centers like ours, you know, will well, over time have resources where we can help you maybe navigate those you know, those sort of false studies versus true ones. Well, the other aspect of this is that the the advocacy groups also have websites where people can go on online and they have information about this. There's an issue if the advocacy group is not saying that vaccines aren't a problem, you know, that the vaccines are fine, that then there's a problem there, right? And we can do whatever we want, but we don't reach the kind of people that it doesn't matter. You know, so... It, even if I stood on every street corner with a megaphone, it wouldn't it wouldn't change the issue. So this is this internet issue. I think we you know we have to hold ourselves as well as the uh, well groups. Uh, oh, thanks. Accountable. This is a very unusual book. Um, I wrote a. Re- this is. Um, can, we should probably turn off the recording of this now. But I'm going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> What goes on in this room stays in this room. But, um, yeah, that room has an iPhone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah, yeah. There are no secrets anymore. Yeah. Um, it was interesting. I had written a, uh, a review of this book after I read it. I wouldn't have probably read it, but uh, Nature Medicine, which is a, a major medical science journal in translational medicine, wanted to write a book, wanted me, asked me to write a book review of it, so I read the book and I wrote a review. And I found the book very compelling and brilliantly written and actually entertaining. It's kind of like a suspense novel. Anyway, this is my opinion. It's a book review. I, I, within, and I was writing it for, how many of you read Nature Medicine? <laughs> no, I mean, hopefully none of you. Yeah. Hopefully nobody here reads Nature Medicine. But the odd thing was within, I mean, because it, it's a very widely read journal in biomedical research, but outside of that, it's, it would be impossible to penetrate most of the stuff written there because it's very specific to fields. Well, it turns out that, that for some reason, this editorial that I'd written for the medical community to understand this issue was read by people in the community, um, and immediately I got very long, detailed letters from very prominent people in some autism advocacy organizations um, really uh, berating me, threatening me, that kind of thing, for writing this 
thing, which was very remarkable to me. No, <laughs> no. but um, um, yeah, we'll talk after this uh, thing. We can talk more about all of those issues. Um, you know, not as part of this symposium. I'll give you opinions, but um, I should also help. I just wanted to um, answer the the question sort of from a clinician standpoint. Um, with, I mean, everybody has raised really good points, and it's a hard problem to deal with as in the field. Um, but as a clinician, you can't blame the parents because they're coming from a place of just wanting to do anything that will help their child. And if, since Dan's already become politically incorrect, if you want to look at it between, you know, a choice between doctors and snake oil salesmen, the reason that people go to snake oil salesmen is because through their interaction with the medical system, something was lacking. They, parents felt somehow that the, the system as it is was not going to help their child, and so they turned to something crazy like chelation or, or whatever was on the internet. And so I think part of that is, as a physician, I mean, you can tell parents, no, there's no evidence behind this, um, you know, this may actively harm your child, um, but it's also that the parent and the family has to feel that you have something to offer, that in coming to see you as opposed to seeing this other person, um, that they, there's hope for their child to get better. It's a really good okay. point. Yeah. So it's yeah. 427. Dan, we're imposing upon your closing remarks. Um, let's answer some more questions. <laughs> yeah, it's better. Yeah. Yeah. So, Dan, I think that the topic itself is very interesting, but I guess uh, historically, the clinician and the medical industry, it's a very close industry, so it's very much in your face. This is the projects you and I have been working on lately. So, again, if you look at it from a different perspective, how much of our budget or our mind share or time is spent going out to the community at large? Because these yeah. Yeah, I think you know. I think um, we try to do as much as we can, which is very limited, and um, it's going to be necessarily limited because our main job, like my main job, is to train the next generation of scientists and, and doctors, and to do research to move things forward, and of course to come out today and try to communicate some of that. But if I spent 95% of my time doing this, then I, I wouldn't be have any credibility on the other side either. So what we need are we need people who are the interfaces, and we need kind of support and infrastructure for people who can work with us to go out and communicate. And so, you know, we've started about four years ago to write a kind of, you know, it's a, it's a shoestring, you know, on our side, little newsletter about what's going on in CART. And we highlight things that have happened in science to get that out there. We try to do that on our website, we, you know, with all these things. It's a really interesting issue because uh, we're in an environment where, where we have our own uh, incentives and other things to do. And we feel it's very, very important to try to communicate with the community. That's why we're here. That's a priority of our center because we realize that we can't do everything. We need to communicate best practices, new stuff that's coming out and all that, and also to share the hope that we have with the community. But I think it's a real challenge. You get a lot of really busy people who are overwhelmed with their day job and everything else, then how do you communicate that? And that's something in academia, in the ivory tower, we always have, it's been a chronic issue. Um, we're trying to pay attention to it, but we can use all the help from you that are here that we can get in terms of trying to, you know, trying to get the message out, right, and trying to, uh, trying to communicate. It's a real, it's an enormous challenge that we have. And the other thing is we're not trained in doing it. So we may not be particularly effective either, even if we, so, so I think it's, it's a really important issue. And many of us have been working with, in our own areas, try, over the last five or six years, trying to engage the community. So... I don't want to toot Cart's horn because I think we have a long way to go. But 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 a, a large number of us, Amanda, Connie, other people, have been working in trying to go out into the community and recruit for studies and provide help to the to areas that normally wouldn't interact. But it, it's a great um, 
It's a great, yeah, I mean, I don't know what to say. It's a, it's a humbling problem. You know, we're humbled by that, um, aside from all the technical difficulties of finding genes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I just wanted to offer something. Some of us are frontline clinicians. You know, we we are in the trenches day after day. We'd love to be researchers, but those desperate families are at our doors. And, you know, I come to conferences like this, and sometimes I'll make referrals, you know, to you or to you. And I think one way to communicate and really help our families get to the right people is for us frontline clinicians, knowing that we could get our family into a study, you know? Who would you take for that brain imaging study? Would you take my, you know, 13-year-old um, who can't sleep? Um, you know, would you take... I think if we felt like we really knew that you would take our kids, because I've tried before and it hasn't really worked, which could be my problem, you know, then our community believes in us, yeah. And then they believe in you. You know, they, they already believe in us, so we can help them believe in you if we can facilitate that. But it's difficult for us because we can't take all kids in all studies. We have to up criteria. However, we're trying to do a better job of announcing our open studies on our website. And Shafali has now put up here um, some of the studies that are going on right now in the cart, and we're listing all the criteria. If you look on our website at www.autism.ucla.edu, um, you'll see all the available studies that are out there and what the general criteria are. So if we can get your kid into a study, we will, if, if, if they meet criteria. And if you call in, um, the people answering the phone will know if, if you say your, your, your child's characteristics, they will tell you refer you to what kind of studies are available for your kid. Yep. Of course, we don't do everything all the time, but you have to keep checking back, so you change what we're doing all the time also. So, yeah, so the website is updated, and uh, there are numbers to call for the, you can, you can refer the families, and if you do have difficulty with that, please do let us know, but our assumption is that all of that is kind of working, and there's somebody there, not 24-7 answering the phones, but during the week, answering the phones for this reason and taking all of that in. So, um, so that's the first point of contact. And do they list <clears throat> all the criteria so I have Yes. To... Okay, so I wouldn't be misdirecting. Well, you know, and, okay. and if, if you feel it's not appropriate, like enough, please give us feedback and like we can, that's, we're assuming it is. Okay. So um, our goal is to make sure that it's easy. You can just click www.autismucla, you know, autism UCLA, go there, see, click on, oh yeah, I have a kid this age, here are the studies for the kid that age, it should work like that, and if it doesn't, let us know. And I would say that you do not need to be on the burden of deciding if someone's necessarily eligible, because sometimes there are nuances in the criteria, but if you have someone who's of the appropriate age range and overall level of functioning, meaning if we have a kid that's studying for kids who are minimally verbal, if you have a child of that age range who are minimally verbal, then that's all they need. They need. They can then call in and then you know, be screened. There's a sort of proper screening process for all the studies. But, yeah, so I think that we're really enjoying ourselves with you. No, really, thank you. Um, and um, so... Uh, a quick announcement before people go. Yeah, Susan has a quick announcement, and then I, I get to say goodbye. For those of you doing CME, don't forget to fill out your orange forms and then fill in your C, CME form and your final evaluation form, as well as your general evaluation forms, and hand them at the front before you leave. Okay, and then Dan. Yeah. First of all, I want to thank you all for staying and asking these questions and giving us the opportunity to, uh, you know, at least feel like we've, you know, you know, communicated some of the research and stuff. We'd like to get feedback from you. It's very, very important because every year, the reason we do this is is to communicate. Now, remember, we're communicating to a very wide range, it's all the way from, you know, from parents and and uh, to. Uh, direct caregivers of, of all types to uh, professionals who, who come for the CME credits and stuff, uh, both medical and psychology and other, and then educators. And, you know, so it's a whole gamut of people who, who come, so we're trying to, to reach all of you. But we're trying to do that. We know we can't do it perfectly, but so give us your feedback from, from whatever your point of view is, what's useful, what's not, what you'd like to see more. And if five or ten of you say the same thing, then you'll see it incorporated next year. If it's just a one-off, it's going to be a little bit less likely because there were 140 people here. And so we'd like to, but but we're really trying to respond to uh, 
you know, to your comments and make this as useful for you as we can. So, um, no, I thank you all for coming and uh, great questions, great participation. I really am uh, really glad you came and um, I, th I think I'm speaking for all of us that it's been a pretty rewarding day for us. I hope it's been useful for you. Thank you. Thank you.